Coming to you direct from the nerve center of the galaxy's greatest comic. This is the 2000 AD Thrill Cars. Borag Thung, Earthlits, and welcome to the 2000 AD Thrill Cast. I'm your host, Molchar. From the battlefields of World War II to the furthest reaches of the galaxy, one of the key writers of British comics in the 1980s was Alan Hebden. Whether it was his work for Battle, co-creating Major Easy, but also El Mestizo, Fighting Man, War Dog, and uh, for Star Wars you had things like Mind Wars for 2000 AD, you had Meltdown Man and so many others. Uh, he was blessed with an incredible roster of uh, artists such as Carl Squera. Uh, Massimo Ballardinelli and Jesus Redondo. Um, he represents a, a very interesting spectrum of stories, like I said, from from uh, uh, war stories for things like battle all the way through to the fantastical for 2000 AD and the new eagle. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure to welcome Alan to the 2000 AD Thrillcast. We sat him down in the sound booth and chatted about his uh, quite extraordinary career in comics, the foundations of it, and what he enjoys writing the most. He is very softly spoken, so uh, turn up the volume and uh, enjoy Earthlet. Well, thank you for coming and, and chatting to the Thrillcast uh, about your, I mean, quite an extraordinary career, really. Um, uh, not, not, not wishing to sort of uh, rub it in or anything, but encompassing a number of decades of, of uh, writing comics. Um, I mean, let's let's just start off the beginning. I mean, tell tell us a bit about your your, your background because we, we I mean we were just talking about the teenage trip that you uh, you went on Italy around, which has given you a lifelong uh, love of it. But, we, but tell us a bit about your family life, where you're from. Uh, where am I from? Nowhere really. I suppose I was born in Bristol. Uh, spent some childhood years in Singapore. My father was an army officer mm. and a comic writer. Um, <laughs> And a museum administrator. Right. Um, he left when he left the army, joined the civil service, and was offered because he'd spent so many years in the Far East. Mm. Um, he was offered a job in Singapore, which at the time was kind of a strange, quasi or quasi independence, where Britain was still responsible for foreign affairs and defence, yeah. and he was working for the Defence Ministry, and he knew it, you know, he knew Singapore, and, uh, and so he went there for a few years. Okay. So how, how old how old were you when well, you were in Singapore? Six to ten. Right, okay. Good good time. Yeah, it's a, a, a fairly, I imagine, quite formative period and, for, uh, for a young lad. And, uh, <clears throat> well, I, mean, I still remember coming, the return, which was on a BOAC comet, um, which is really amazing, you know. <laughs> sort of. And when I started school here, I sort of everybody's envious. Oh, you've been on a BOC jet, wow! <laughs> but um, anyway, he got a job at the National Army Museum as the administrative officer when it when it opened. Mm. Originally, it opened in Sandhurst. It wasn't in Chelsea. It opened in Sandhurst, in nineteen sixty, um, and he got a post there. Mm. And that's where we moved after Singapore. And he, um, <clears throat> and that was so when we lived in Farnborough in Hampshire, which is where I sort of spent my teenage years. Mm. And during that time, he started writing for comics. Um, sort of, some sort of series, but um, he did, he did, he did like endless true stories for, for, uh, for Victor and, Hornet and these DC Thompson's stuff. Yeah. Um, and he ended up doing a load of them for battle too, actually, mm, yeah. over, the, over the years. Um, so I suppose that's where I kind of got the idea of writing. I mean, I sold him some, some plots early on. Right. Um, but I've always, I've, I've always liked writing myself. Mm. You know, and uh, English has always been probably my best subject apart from history. Sure. Uh, I like English. I like the language, and I like writing. I enjoy so, writing. So, you, you, I mean, was your dad always into writing, or was it just something that he took up? 
I'm sure he was always a writer of some sort. He mm. must have had it in him, you know, but it sort of... Um, but actually, I think he ended up... He, he just answered an ad in the... In, probably the Telegraph or something. Mm. DC Thompson's he used to put in ads for looking for writers, you know, sure. all help given. Um, so he answered it and went on from there, really. So you're, you're, you're growing up in your dad's writing comics. I mean, were you like a, a typical uh, boy at the time? Did you sort of avidly devour... Um, uh, the comics of, of, of uh, yeah, well, we didn't have to pay for them. Cause <laughs> he started, he started writing for when he started writing for Fleetway. Yeah. Um, well, you know, they they were terrific because they would send every issue of War Picture Library, Battle Picture Library, mm. Air Ace Picture Library, um, and um, they'd always be flowing through the, through the letterbox. Uh, so I got all those every month free another source of envy from from people at school and then um and we also got lion tiger mm. um yeah you know so yeah. was was your was your dad drawing on uh you know his his, his own experiences of being in the forces or because you said he, he he was working for the national army museum I guess well, he was he was quite into his history. I mean, right. he liked army history, and he had a sort of you know. I mean, I mean, he was very good at that. Mm. I mean, we had a whole library of books about it. Um, but I mean, in those days, all oh, that's pretty much the only stories that you did were war stories, mm. one way or another. Um, they were either war stories or sports stories, you know, mm. football stories and so on, um, and or, or sort of adventure stories. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think he just got in, you know, he's, I think once he started doing the command, commando and, and well, he's no, before he started doing commando, he started, he was doing war picture libraries. Mm. Um, and, uh, I always pretty much stuck to that, you know, sort of, I mean, that, the series he wrote for battle, uh, Day of the Eagle, mm. you know, which was a terrific, a terrific series. And, um. But again, it was always a war. It was, it was, it was quite happy to work with battle. Because mm -hmm. one thing that I've I've noticed when when I've when I've read about um, uh, the writers of the the fifties, sixties, seventies, World War Two kind of seems to loom so large in the imagination. And, and you know, you, I've read stories about editorial at DC Thompson, which was packed with ex army. Well, of course Captains it was, and, and, you know, and things I mean, like that. Was, uh, and, you know, virtually everybody's parents had, you know, were, had first-hand experience of the war. Mm. Uh, and in most cases, their grandparents, like mine, had experience of the First World War, you know, and it was sort of, uh, I mean, it was very much, you know, it was only sort of still less than 20 years or so, really, 20, mm. 25 years back. It was only a generation, you know, gone. Um, so, yes, it was. It did loom big mm. for quite a long time. Because it, 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 the, the the sheer popularity of of World War Two comics uh, in the sixteen seventies, and then it it peters out in the nineteen eighties. Um, I've always wondered whether uh, you know what 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 the the kind of psychological not sociological reason for, for that popularity was whether it was kind of the you know these new generations trying to relate to this thing that their parents and their grandparents had had such a experience of like it's probably <clears throat> you'd probably say it was a deterioration in schooling <laughs> <Right>. um, <laughs> I think I think apart all right yes earlier earlier on it was like the war was only you know was still relatively recent or sort of not that far mm. in the past mm, there was i suppose a period where it kind of receded but there's been loads of new histories since i mean you should ask garth ennis about this mm, yeah. he's um because i agree with him as well and I, i'm just saying um the appreciation now is increasingly what an absolutely unbelievable scale it was on mm. we don't realize we are you know we live our soft little lives now mm. and sort of pampered and and everybody weeps and hugs well um 
there was this huge great convulsion that swept the globe you know I mean sort of 70 80 million people would kill directly from it mm. you know I mean this is an amazing sort of rate of you know you see see entire navies were sunk do you have you had a you had like the United States produced an air force which was over 50,000 aircraft mm. strong and all the people to fly it all yeah. the training and everything it needed to do mm. it and um and it was and, and and Germany how Germany managed how did they manage to sort of how did they actually manage to last so long is probably the the real mystery um not the, not so much that they lost um and actually they might not even have lost at one point mm. but Something on that scale, there is plenty, therefore, I guess, plenty of scope for telling pretty much any story you yes. want to tell. Yes. There's a background, anything will go. So, you, your dad's writing comic books. Did did you go to university or anything like that? Yeah. Okay. To study history or English or? Middle Eastern history. Middle Eastern history. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Um so did, did uh, were you looking to become a writer at the time? Um, I suppose I probably knew I was going to end up writing some something or other. Right. Um, I mean, I never actually finished university because I started writing comics. You know, okay. I mean, it seemed sort of, a bit, and, and to be honest, I mean, whatever. I mean, the subject I was doing wasn't really probably going to be a get you into a sort of fabulous job or anything straight away i mean it's more like you'd end up you'd end up um, in academia or something mm. and i didn't want to do that and uh i like my freedom too much and i sort of realized quite early on this is what this this offered the freedom mm. Mm. and i didn't have to report to work every day i didn't have to be in a wage slave anymore it was up to me Sure. You know, and at that time, pretty much you could do as you could do as much or as little as you wanted. And you know, I mean, my 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 tendency was to write like fury for a couple of months, and then take a couple of months off mm. and go off places. You know, I mean, I went to go to India, go to go to America, go around Europe. You know, that sounds fairly idyllic to to me, to be honest. With you. Well, it's not much idyllic. It was just like a sort of it could be done, so I did it. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and somehow it was sort of seemed a lot easier to get, a lot, a lot easier and a lot more exciting to get around back mm. then, you know. And like flying was actually quite adventure, quite still quite an adventure, and it mm. was quite pleasant, you know. And, uh, you didn't have to go through all these checks and everything. Airports are still exciting places, and uh, yeah. It's flew all over the place in the end. So what was the, can you remember what the, the first comic story that you sold was? Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to talk about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, somebody, somebody did come up with a name, it's sort of, it's, um, it's, you know, the one about, the one about the giant mutant cane toads in tr trashing Queensland. Right. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> wasn't actually my idea anyway see I mean that's always been a that's always been a problem with me how so? well I don't like doing other people's ideas right okay. <laughs> I don't like using other people's creations well, I mean that's a subject when we when we talk a bit more about battle that's, that's a subject I, I was going to come on to um, so the who who were you selling to was it the, the, the same ones as like, like Victor and Lion and things like that um, did something, for, did a few things for Lion, mm. um, certainly for Victor and Hornet, right? But also, I was sort of doing war picture libraries, you see, quite quite soon, and they, yeah. they they were actually quite relatively well paid, much better paid than Commando, for mm. instance. You see, um, you know, you can get about, about twice as much for a, for a war picture library, right? And you had to wait about two or three times as long to get paid <laughs> but at least you know once it came it was, it was um, there was a lot more of it yeah and in a way I think they were they, they went for better 
they went for more daring stories, more kind of, you know, more violence, more mm. bit, you know, early battle, if you want. Sure. Kind of reflected the f- reflected the ethos in Fleetway, which is, wasn't D.C. Thompson. Well, that, it was something I was going to ask about was um, the, the thing that's really struck me, uh, the more I've read about it, the more I've heard about the, 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 the period, was actually how different... Um, these two companies were, though you know Fleetway was not without its its own kind of conservative small C uh, elements. Um, could you were you able to see the, like the, the 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 grounding, the foundations that would eventually lead to things like battle and and, and action in two thousand eighty at Fleetway? No, no. Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, these things sort of. I mean, you know, it's like. Um, Obviously, one could answer with hindsight and sound really wise. Mm. Um, but, um, you know, do you know where gaming is going to go in the next few years? Do you have really any idea? Mm. I mean, if there's one subject which everybody thinks they know but always gets wrong, it's futurology or thinking thinking they know what's mm. coming. And obviously, you don't know what's coming because, you know, it'll always be not what you're expecting. So this thing came about, you know, and I suppose, yes, all right, maybe War, War, Pitch, War Pitch Library especially had probably had a had an influence. Mm. And it was, you know, they were kind of, they tend to be more gritty stories than, than Commando. And so that was a kind of battle ethos, really, of being gritty mm. sort of stories. And, what, and what, what, what was your relationship with, with editorial like? Because it always seems to me that there, there were um, uh, creators, both writers and artists, who would often be going into... Uh, the offices and talking to people and then there'd be those who'd just be at the end of a, uh, a phone line or you know they'd just send their stuff in and that that, that would be it what, what was your relationship with them well i mean i lived in london i went to see them you know right. i mean i sort of you know I, I, um i think most actually most it wasn't until later that i think i think doing you we were thompson's you did do it long distance mm. you know i mean i don't i mean it's at least one commando editor I know I, I did sort of you know probably done about 30 40 commandos with, for him never met him or anything right. my father did at one time because they back in those days they even invited you up to Dundee you know if you were <laughs> put you you know they could go up on the sleeper and they put you up at a hotel right um and wine and dine you and plenty of scotch and then but um I never I never knew anybody up there right Never actually met. I never actually met a commando editor until George Lowe, until he came down to London. Right. Um, it was completely different to an IPC, and, or you know where. Just go to the office. Right. You know. And, uh, I mean, I never posted anything there. I took it in. Mm. Had a chat. Got lunches. Um, Usually, sort of get a ream of typing paper if you needed it. Um, that's a that's a novel idea these days. The, the idea of the company uh, supplying, or, or or do you mean just kind of going to a stationery shop and buying it? Or well, no, just sort of take it from the take it from the sort of stack on the shelf there. <laughs> oh, I'd say yeah, grab this one, yeah. No, yeah. No. Um, oh. Yeah, the, the idea of one of our writers coming and going, can I, can I just have this paper? It's printer paper. What are you doing? <laughs> Very strange. Let's talk about battle, because um, uh, uh, I mean, just from the, the sheer page of notes that I've got in front of me, it, it, it's it's something I wanted to to really delve into. Um, what what was your first experience of battle? Were, were, were you in, uh, involved in the, the 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 prep for it or? Did you come on later? I can't really. T- I can't really remember. Actually, right. I mean, I went for. A, I got invited. I got invited to lunch with Pat Mills. And I think that was sort of it was first discussed. Right. Um, I have to say, in its original form, I wasn't that keen because it was basically a. Basically, all the stories have been sort of mapped out. Mm. You know. And you were supposed to carry on from them, and this is my lifelong aversion. I do not like doing other people's stories or creations. It never works, and so you know. So really, I suppose I could say that I didn't really take off with with battle until Easy came along because mm. it was my creation. 
Because you, you, you did um, Rat Pack. Yeah, a, a yeah and I had day series. An ongoing war with that over the years about, I said there was too many characters. <clears throat> um, five characters, you know, five characters in a sort of six page, a six page story mm. um, where everyone's got to kind of do their bit. It's just too many. Mm. I mean, I've got, I've had a, I've kind of ripped it off with, with a, with a commando series called Convict Commandos, um, where you've got a whole commando book to write a story. Yeah, um, but I only got four characters in it. Even that's quite enough, you know. <laughs> um, and having five was, I thought we thought Rogan was completely superfluous. He jumped, he swung, he climbed. <laughs> yeah, why? <right>, wow. <laughs> Wait, um, you were, uh, I think you initially started doing things like Battle Honours, which were like... No, my father did those. Oh, was, was it your father? Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Um, again, sort of true life tale. That's all his. Right. I never did, never did true life tale oh, in my right. life. Okay. Oh, no, that's interesting. <laughs> that's interesting. I mean, it was uh, clearly that's what he enjoyed doing the most was... Well, that's what he's good stuff. at doing as yeah. well, you know. I mean, there's no point in having somebody trying to do it with somebody who doesn't know what they're actually writing about, mm. you know. And he had all the references and he had, you know, and he knew historians, you know, he knew military historians who, mm. who often would fill him in with some ideas of their own. And that's how he got a lot of the ideas from, I think. So was it, was it your association with Battle that brought him on or was, did he pitch this stuff himself no he's the one that got he was the one that um, got onto battle first right. okay um, because of the stuff he was doing for the stuff he was doing for War Picture Library mm. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious about this relationship where um, you're, you're, you're both writing for the same publications no, no hint of any rivalry or no, we lived yeah. separate lives. I wasn't. No I didn't even live at home, you know. <laughs> no, no. no. It's home anyway. I mean, yeah. that was, you know, um, I, uh, no, I, you know, looked at that. Yeah, that's good. That's a nice one. Other ones, I thought, mm, a bit boring, that one. There you go. <laughs> um, no, there wasn't a rivalry or anything like uh, that, or any, any sort of, you know. Well, I mean, you, you, you did strips like um, uh, The General Dies at Dawn uh, and, 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 and various others. But as you say, it was it was kind of Major Easy that was the, 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 the strip that really took off. Um, had you had any... Because... Uh, sort of, uh, had you had any contact with Carlos Esquerra? Because they, um, no. uh, his, 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 his artwork had been spotted in, in one of DC Thompson's yeah, titles yeah. and there had to be sort of investigations about who he was because they didn't print credits or anything like that. Um, so you, did you know that he was going to be doing the strip at the beginning? No. No? Okay. No. Well, what was your I reaction? I known him from Adam. Right. What was your reaction to, to, to when, when you actually finally saw it? I thought the first couple weren't terribly good. Oh, really? Yeah. I thought they were a bit kind of a bit too rough. Yeah. They did, but they, but they did improve very quickly after that. Mm. Um, I think he was still feeling his way. Sure. Um, and if you look at the first couple of episodes and then carry on from there, it's it changes quite quickly into mm. this sort of settles down into the recognisable easy style. Um, Oh, it suited him, so yeah. Mm. yeah. Can you talk a bit about the inspiration uh, for Major Easy? Because everyone always refers to James Coburn and and you know and the, the films he was in. Where, where did where did Easy well, come Coburn from? Coburn was a character, yeah. But the films were definitely the sort of Clint Eastwood spaghetti westerns. I mean, mm. that kind of that was that character, the man with no name character. Yeah, the loner. Um, but um, but yes, you know the way Carlos drew him, he was like he looked like James Coburn. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, that was fine. Too. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't that I was concerned about. It was the character I was concerned about. You know, sure. it was sort of like this seemed to be a worth a try. Mm. 
because I, I, I remember sort of reading reprints when I was younger of it and, and finding it a shock that he was British, even though, you know, everybody else is British, because it, it, by that point it had become such a, a, a cliche of the kind of laconic uh, American officer, you know, a bit scruffy, etc. Um, yeah, but actually, I mean, I suppose in a way I never really thought of him as being... I, if anything, he's actually quite anti-American. Mm. Um, I never thought of him as being American. I would think of him more in of being a sort of Lawrence of Arabia type. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, his history is, you know, like he comes, he came from India driving his Bentley across overland. You see, <laughs> and he's sort of he's an Eastern expert. Yeah. Uh, so yes, he would have been a one of the old India hands, and they were pretty eccentric too. A lot of them. Um, there weren't any Americans, I should imagine, like Easy. Like, there wasn't, wouldn't have been anybody like Easy because mm. you know they wouldn't have survived. <laughs> um, but as characters go, yes, I think I'd like to think of it as more in the <clears throat> more in the line of more in the line of the sort of uh, the, the British or the British imperial kind of loners mm. who sort of you know actually did all sorts of crazy things. I think crazier things than most Americans ever did. Mm. Um, and Easy was sort of, I think, in that kind of, comes from that kind of line, not from, certainly not an American. I know he saw people think he sort of looked American, blah, blah, blah. But um, actually, you should see, <clears throat> see pictures of, um, of Lawrence of Arabia smoking a cheroot. And he mm. looks pretty like Easy, you know. And, he's <laughs> sort of, and, and also, Easy's. Easy was really kind of like I don't know he was a bit amorphous where he was where he was supposed to be. I mean, I I think I wanted him originally as a long range desert group person, which would have been, suited him fine. But I don't think there was enough uh, scope, so he kind of got became more general. Mm -hmm. This was this was the desert when we were in the desert. I mean, he was sort of you know with Chufik and stuff mm -hmm. later ones. It was a bit kind of like that, but it wasn't wasn't like solely a, a long range desert group mm. thing you know and obviously by the time they got to, by the first series of set the first part was set in Italy um, you know when it was just a regular war mm. and, what, what was the attraction of uh, Easy's character for you it was, I, I, I presume it was enjoyable to write because you uh, certainly with some of the humour it seems like you were like, having a lot of fun well yeah you know it was he had good one-liners. Um, he uh, he was uh, he drank, he gambled. Well, he didn't actually gamble. He played cards and won. Um, <laughs> um, he could be extremely violent, um, and yet, I suppose basically he was a good guy. You know. And he'd go out of his way to help people if he had to. Because it was your first major strip, certainly the the, the, the one that kind of continued beyond its uh, uh, initial run. I mean, what do you think was the appeal to the kids who were reading Battle? Because there, there, there were so many different characters, all you know, very violent and 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 gritty. But Easy seemed to really well. It became the number one strip. In yeah. battle, well, you know, I suppose mixture of the stories, the artwork, and there you go. Mm -hmm. That's how how these things happen. Um, obviously, the character appealed to people, to readers. Uh, I think because he was kind of anti-establishment. He wasn't your normal officer. Mm. In fact, completely abnormal officer. <laughs> I, I, I mean, even in battle, he stood out because you know you, you look at characters like D-Day Dawson, even Darkie's Mob. They're, they're they're still very much kind of you know conventional conventional uh, characters. Where whereas Easy was, was as you say, he, he, undoubtedly if he'd been real, he wouldn't have survived. Yeah. <laughs> um. Well, you know, yes, that's sort of, as I say. I mean, you know, I think. He was he was an oddball character for the for the time, and uh, it obviously had an appeal. Mm. What was your initial 
proposal to 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 editorial for the character was it was it as as it eventually came yeah pretty much right okay but there was um what was he originally going to be called Ca- uh, captain carlisle yeah All right there was a no major carlisle uh, major carlisle sorry. there was a there was a movie a couple of years earlier mm. called major dundee uh charlton heston i think it was mm. a good movie actually gritty stuff yeah. you know sort of, sort of American Civil War movie mm. and um, I just sort of thought you know it's kind of name I'd like but then we got easy from Dave Hunt so there you go I don't, I'm not complaining <laughs> <laughs> well that, that was one thing I wanted to ask about because we mentioned movies a couple of times it, there, there was such a uh, an absolute wealth of great war movies in the 60s and 70s um and it, 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 so much of of what battle did seemed to just draw yeah, for inspiration dirty dozen was you know yeah there's a rat pack writ large and uh i've gone some of the others now and like, like we said with, with a a conflict as sprawling as world war Two, the 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 potential for Endless stories in 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 that mould is 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 infinite, really, isn't it? Well, one thing Battle did was bring in the was bring in the Russian front, mm. which uh, you know, it's like somehow up until then it was sort of somehow this 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 where sort of three quarters of all the war was fought didn't actually sort of figure, mm. um, and um, and that kind of opened it up a bit. Yes, you could then. That left that gave you a much greater scope. You realise that uh, you realise you could actually sort of you know head head east, mm. where it was a much nastier war. Um, one of the things that, that made me laugh was uh, um, uh, Easy's German counterpart. He was he was ma- Major Leicht, yeah, which is German, German for Easy. For easy. <laughs> it, it, it's those little touches of humour that that always seem to. Uh, well, the, the more bread important a bit. part of it was that he was he was like easy he mm. was German easy see and that's how that's um, um, well, if one, that was the kind of joke <laughs> he wasn't just had the same name mm. he was the same type yeah right there. Cause it, 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 it's interesting in a strip like that where um, correct me if I'm wrong but there's a a, a, a line drawn between uh, Nazis and Germans. So, uh, in, in in the same way that somebody, let's say, for example, Rommel was was you know an honourable army officer and was treated so he wasn't a fanatical Nazi. Somebody like liked there's there's a certain degree of a code of honour between these two men who were trying to trying to kill each other. I mean, was 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 that um, well not necessarily kill each other but confound each other? Um, well, they would have had more in common often mm. than. Than some of the German army officers would have had with the SS, but uh, you know, I mean, that gets into the whole sort of concept of the good German and the bad German. Mm. It? And, uh, when in fact, let's face it, um, yeah, by and large, they were all pretty bad because they actually did sort of, you know, the army wasn't didn't stand, the army didn't stand by during the atrocities in mm. the East. It actively took part in it, you know. Um, the idea that you know the sort of and also the idea that sort of the ss was sort of somehow cowardly as well mm. you know because they're bullies they obviously have to be cowardly but you know some of their best fighting units were ss units when when, when you're writing war comics um because battle was known for being gritty and violent how far were you able to go because I, I know there was there was um um there's the 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 incident where um uh a, a little grenade was added um, yeah, to stop, uh, yeah. yeah, stop Easy being considered a cold-blooded killer. Yeah, well, of course. What I liked about that much more than much more than that was the way that, of course, nobody seemed to notice that the that the woman could get away with it yeah. at the end. You know, let me kill him, and she did. You see, killed him point blank. Um, so it was kind of a bit of bit sending mixed signals. Out. Yeah, well, it, it, it's. I mean, the, you kind of look at the morality and 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 the the, the the ethics of war comics and and the 
sometimes the lines are very, very stark. Uh, particularly I mean, when I, I, I had no problem with, with, with easy really killing right. him straight off you know <laughs> never did I mean it wasn't sort of he was that sort of guy yeah but, but how can when you're writing these things and obviously you know you're, you're dealing with a conflict conflict that was very savage very brutal but you're writing for children even though these children are lapping up you know gritty dark tales of of of, of, uh, of war stories um how far were you able to, to 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 push it before editorial maybe would would rein you back in? Well, I don't know. really easy. I mean, after all, we have a we have the church massacre story. Mm. That was uh, you know, I mean, that was uh, that was actually pretty gritty. Mm. Um, so I don't, you know, I mean, I suppose, I suppose if you had, you couldn't really sort of. You couldn't really have them. Well, actually, you could, yes. I mean, you know, what was wrong with sort of, you know, lining people up against the wall and shooting them? You know, mm. plenty of scenes in loads of different different uh, stories uh, where that happened. Um, I mean, I don't think even 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 people disappearing in explosions, where they kind of disintegrate in explosions, you know, I mean, this, this is, you know, quite normal. Mm. Um and I suppose largely because it was in black and white, you didn't have to have the blood. Um, it, it, it always struck me that, that sometimes editorial, well, higher up editorial, w- would have weird attitudes towards certain things. So um, you know, you can't have too much blood spatter. Can't specifically see a. Um, I can't remember which strip it was exactly. You had it changed so that you specifically didn't see the bullet go into the person. It kind of. They had their backs to you when they got shot in the front, kind of thing. Yeah, and then no, the, I didn't. It was yeah. going into people. It, it's and it, but then you, later on when um, Battle started reprinting um, uh, Major Easy's early stuff. Uh, I mean, this this was a, a few years down the line. Um, IPC had a fairly anti-smoke, a fairly stringent anti-smoking policy. So if somebody came in and whited out. Um, you know, what can you say? <laughs> I mean, I could say a lot, but I shall, I shall maintain a discreet silence about that. <laughs> uh, um, it's just simply sh- shooting yourself in the foot, actually. Mm. Self-defeating. There you go. You know, you, if you're going to start applying, if you're going to start applying sort of values retrospectively, mm. um, then you could probably alter most of... Uh, most of literature at some point or other. I mean, Bond would be a absolute no-no now. One thing that um, I, I saw in the, uh, an interview you did for one of the collected Titan editions of, of, of Major Easy was uh, your uh, idea of what um, Easy would do after the war um, where he'd, he'd become a Nazi hunter. Yeah, well, you know, got to do something. And, uh, <laughs> uh, he seems quite well equipped for the job. Got all the skills. Yeah, and also perhaps he's, he's more likely to take the Russian attitude. Mm. Um, not bother with the uh, not bother with the tiresome business of trials and so on and so forth. Find them, kill them. <laughs> Looking back on Major Easy. Um, like I said, it, it was your first major series. It was, it was the first one that, that, that you did that really ran uh, for, for a substantial period of time beyond its original run. Um, as, as a writer, did that teach you anything different? Did you, uh, you know, what, what did you learn from the process of, of, of not just the length, but also the success of something like Major Easy? That I didn't like characters that went on and on. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I finished him off. Right. At the end, really, you know. I mean, I don't, I don't want to do any more. Uh, I, I don't really believe in this this idea of you know if you find a great character, you just run and run with it. Sure. Um, you know, like Johnny Red, it's sort of interminable, really. You know, Charlie's War, on and on and on. Mm. And in the end, you know, I mean, I. In the end, it stops you. It stops you from sort of thinking of thinking up new stories, new ideas, new characters. Mm. <clears throat> like it's a bit lazy. 
I don't sort of, you know, I mean, I, I was happy that it went along for a while, and mm. it was quite a useful, it was quite a useful, useful method of amassing enough cash quickly to take off. Because <laughs> I could, one, I think at one point I wrote, I wrote maybe fifteen of them in about two weeks. Good God, and uh, and then just took off for India. Right, uh, <laughs> and. Um, but, you know, it just became a bit repetitive, really. Mm. I mean, I, I don't see the appeal of, <clears throat> of, of going on and on with characters. And everybody else seemed to think, oh, yeah, obviously, you know, you should flog them to death, resurrect them, and flog them to death again if mm. you have to. But, you know, no. I could see the writing on the wall with, and then I ran it with a rat pack. Yeah. And, um, you know, I. I myself just knew I didn't want to go on with this. Yeah, and that was, it was enough. Because the, 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 it, the, it was a, a kind of strange crossover of Major Easy and Rat Pack. At, at, I don't at, think it was particularly point. strange, really. I mean, well, it, it wasn't really the done thing back then. Oh, I mean, oh, that well, yeah. a lot of things weren't the done thing back then. <laughs> I suppose. Um, well, it just seemed fairly logical. Mm. Carlos was quite keen. He wrote, he, you know, he, he'd drawn Rat Pack as well as Easy. So. El Mestizo, mm. which is a, a, a character you did with, uh, with Carlos again. Um, I've always found very intriguing because, uh, number one, it was the American Civil War. Number two, it was um, a different perspective on the American Civil War. And thirdly, that you... you, you uh, you have a, a, a well mixed race character, so because uh, that's what El Mestizo means is is, is somebody of, of, of mixed race. Um, where, where, where did the, the the idea for that originally come from? Um, I don't know. Can't even remember actually. I've sort of, I think it was to do with. I thought I probably been reading something about the American Civil War. I mean, it's quite a good history of it, and I was sort of I tend to plough through some of these history books and uh, it occurred to me you know I mean this was a pretty vicious conflict as well and and it was sprawling as well you know it wasn't just you know out in the east you know there was a lot of stuff happening in the west mm. and, um, and um, and then I suppose you, you go in back to the back to the sort of spaghetti western idea you need a character who can a character who can play both sides mm. if you want and doesn't belong to either yeah which is very much you know what well the good the bad and the ugly for instance was, if you want that was probably the that was probably the nearest the nearest um inspiration to it mm. but um you know and i think <clears throat> i know carlos was quite keen on doing a historical one and uh so came up with this mm -hmm. But of course, it wasn't the war story, so it was a long war, so you know, people didn't like it. <laughs> well, it certainly, having talked to Carlos a, a couple of times about it, it, it's one he still has a remarkable amount of, of, of affection for. Yeah. Oh, all right. It wasn't a bad story. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it was, it was the wrong place for it, I suppose, or the wrong mm. time, I don't know, you know, it's like that. Apparently, they call these letters about people, you know, oh, it's not a war story. Oh, no, no, no. It's about people killing each other. What else, what else do they want? I mean, you know. <laughs> it, it, there's there's a, a quote, I think it's either from uh, uh, Dave Hunt or, or Steve, I can't remember who it was, just saying about how battle had such an incredible turnover of stories that as soon as something it was clear that the strip wasn't working. It'd be wrapped up and, and replaced by something else. And I suppose from a, a freelancer's point of view, that's quite a good thing to be happening because you can just keep pitching pitching ideas, um, particularly if you're not precious about them going on forever. Um, yes, yes. There was <laughs> some idea to... There was something to... You know, I mean, you knew that... I mean, it wasn't until later on I suppose into the 80s where it started becoming the sort of Charlie's War Johnny Red magazine mm. um, sort of again you know to me the anathema of the 
are the endless are the endless stories um and um but before then yeah i mean it was well it's good because you could experiment all right we tried the civil war that didn't work um very well the other one did though the different the other different war fighting man oh yes the vietnam war one i was, mm. was going to ask about that because um there, there hadn't been that many uh if any vietnam war no. stories by that point period yeah <laughs> it, it, no, there had been no. No, there, there had been no. Been there had been no. no. Why, why, why did you decide it's only to? About sort of four or five years. Yeah. Since, since it finished, you see. Hmm. Well, again, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm reasonably knowledgeable about these things. <laughs> I read. I, I grew up in the civil, in, during the Vietnam War. Yeah. I followed it quite closely. Actually, I became sort of quite intrigued by it mm. and then um, and I was thinking about this having a having a doing a Vietnam War one it was tricky though it was like like the Korean War you see people sort of I mean that's, that's that, that is actually one war I've always avoided um, I find it well first of all it's it, you can't really pre the, the British the British kind of involvement in it was too small to mm. make it, you know, that terribly realistic, um, and therefore too easily identifiable. You know about these, where these places were. Sure. Um, on the other hand, of course, Vietnam had no British involvement at all. There were Australians there, mm. but they were a very minor part too. But what it had was this, this kind of. I don't know, it's just a sort of insane kind of war. I couldn't. Kind of, it was. It was. It was so amorphous. A way that even the way the the troops lived, like you know, you'd be sort of you'd be boozing it up in Saigon one day, fighting for your life in the in the bush the next day, and back in Saigon or wherever the day after. Mm. And in a way, the the troops for the first time, I think, in any war, the troops lived like the the Air Force pilots had, had always lived, mm. where, you know, you have a comfortable billet and off you go to, into your fight, but you get, if you survive, you get back home again mm. that night. And, uh, and in a way, that's what the Vietnam War became, mm. it seemed to be, anyway, to me. And you had this suitably fanatical enemy who, who would get up to no good and was apparently just abs absolutely tenacious. Um, and you had all these other side things that were going on. It was like, you know, the Montanard tribesmen and the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia who weren't sort of was murderous then. Um, and the Patet Lao. And, they were, and all these people who were lumped together, of course, as being the communists mm. were actually at each other's throats as much as anybody else. They were sort of, you know, I mean, this, this was something I did realise quite, quite early on. Um, and... Um, and over and above it, you have this sort of this kind of lunatic attempt by the Americans to impose this, impose themselves on this on this chaos, just and just merely adding to it, you know, as they went. And no matter how much hardware they put into it, how much technology. I mean, I've forgotten. At some point, I did read one thing once that it that it, it that that a single Viet Cong death. Cost about between ten and twelve million dollars. Um, so you know it wasn't really a sort of terribly efficient kind of way of doing things. Yeah. Um, but because it was like that, it meant it. You couldn't, you know. I mean, you either stuck with a kind of platoon or something, you know, like 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 the deer hunter mm. idea, which never appealed to me anyway. I'm not. I don't like those sort of stories. Very much. I certainly don't like writing them. And um, but you had, uh, or you have the sort of the loner in who's who's got its own agenda, mm. where he can move from place to place and scene to scene. And um, and then I saw Apocalypse Now. I thought, oh, this is this is good. <laughs> That's the sort of idea. The, yeah. kind of, the guy in search of something. Mm. Right. I mean, Apocalypse Now. He was in search of the Mad Colonel. And, in Fighting Man, is a guy looking for his son, who everybody had written off yeah. um, under very suspicious circumstances. 
Um, but he had his he had his contacts and his friends too. So he sort of, and, uh, and it meant I could move him around. So you could go, you know, you could have you could have a you could be fighting in the bush, and then next episode, the next couple of episodes, you'd be on an aircraft carrier. Mm. Uh, I had a real aircraft carry, the Forest Store, which got, which nearly got sunk. Um, when somebody, when, well, in fact, I've got the scene I show in, in that is, is, is for real. You know, a, a Sidewinder missile was fired on deck mm. accidentally because it hadn't been locked by the armorer. Um, and that's what started the fire that nearly sunk the ship. Mm. Um, but it was, I, you know the news. The news at the time had been full of it. Astounding pictures, and uh, and so you know, I put it into the put it into the story. When 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 you're writing a series like that, um, and and including actual historical I- I- I events, is there is there a, a a line between what you make fictional and and what you keep? real or was, was it not as sort of delineated as that? actually I yeah. mean it was such a sort of great chaotic event that you could just easily slip people into it mm. you, know, you slip your characters into it um, I mean right, it was a ship burning but it was except it was a it was a sort of 50,000 ton ship with, mm. which carried sort of 100, 100 warplanes and a crew of nearly 5,000 it was a city Mm. Or if it was a city, a floating city that was on fire. Um, so in a way, in all that chaos, it was quite easy to get. To, you know, there's no problem putting, mm. putting putting slipping people into it. You know, I mean, I mean, I mean, you do it all the time. I mean, if you're going to have a, you know, right? I mean, do a war story. Well, it's Arnhem. Mm. Well, there's a real life event, isn't it? It's not something you make up. I don't know how many war stories you'll find about Arnhem. But it's probably more than the people who took part in it actually <laughs> um so you know yes it's, you know obviously obviously anything like that it's always you can't you can't divorce it from history you can't divorce it from, from what it was like all the war stories obviously they have to be about things that happen mm. you know places where it happened you can't just sort of invent a, a new front somewhere um and you don't need to mm. so much was happening but it's, it's like the point you made earlier about, um, you know, if, if you're if you're writing a story about someone trying to assassinate the goal, it doesn't doesn't necessarily have to contradict reality. It, it but you can still tell a, a an amazing story within the confines of what yeah history laid out. Yes, I mean you know you know you know he fails, but the interest is that well, how does he fail after mm. all this having having got so far and done so you know done it so well. Mm. To get, to get so close, how does he get? How does it mess up? And um, and you know, you, do, you can do that. You can do that with the Vietnam War, of course. I mean, you know, it was a disaster in the end for the Americans. Mm. Um, but like, you know, to remember, it was a disaster for Vietnam as well. It was actually a disaster for Southeast Asia. Um, but see, I lived at a time when you had this, this barking mad theory of what they call a domino effect. Mm. You had to stop the communists in Vietnam because then Thailand would go and then Malaya and Burma and then it would be India and Singapore and you know, it was like a sort of there was absolutely no proof for this. It was a typical American thing of lumping together a region, calling it Southeast Asia and thinking that everybody was the same in it mm. when in fact they were all completely different. Um, you know, there's, they're as varied in Southeast Asia is as varied as Europe, um, and of course, as we as we know, even after the even after the Americans left, they were still having wars there. The Chinese invaded Vietnam mm. in 1978. Uh, Vietnam invaded Cambodia. Do you know, sort of <laughs> um, we didn't need the Americans there, really. I mean, you know, the Americans just have this sort of strange idea that. You know, everybody wanted to be like them, mm. and they still do actually. But there you go. <laughs> so, while you were working for Battle, were you, were you still doing stuff for Commando at the time? Yeah, I would always do Commandos. Yeah. Okay, I like Commandos. I like 
I like having, I like being able to create my own self-contained stories. Mm. I like self-contained stories. I like stories with, with endings. I don't see the point of stories that don't have endings. I find them, you know, they're kind of soap opera, really, aren't they? It's sort of like if you haven't got an ending, you've got a soap opera. Just or a telenovela, it just goes on and on and on. Um, so I've always liked, always quite liked doing those. I mean, that brings me very neatly onto uh, kind of the next phase of your career, which was um, uh, with 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 two thousand AD, um, and the fact that you did a lot of future shocks. I've actually always been, I'd always been a science fiction fan. Mm. Uh, I had a, I was fortunate in the middle of the war stories and everything else, where we lived in Farnborough, there was not far off, there was a little, it was a second-hand bookshop mm. uh, where you could <clears throat> buy things for sixpence and sell them back for threepence, mm. sort of like, you know, kind of a bit of a library in a way. But, sure. But not like not like the not like the not like the um, municipal library. This was one which was shelves packed full of galaxy magazines and mm. and astounding tales. The, 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 the monthly the monthly sort of collections of short stories, which of course showcased some of the best science fiction writers who ever lived mm. at that time. Um, and I used to go through those like just drank them up actually I love them you know and uh, and some of them were good and some of them were a load of rubbish but I quite like space pop that's right. what it was in a way mm. but space pop done well is just as good as anything else were there any particular writers that, that oh, called Wayne Smith Wayne Smith yeah. absolutely yeah uh, you know he's just he was just the he was the guy with the ideas in a way, and mm. the whole sort of his whole. And he also, he did it. He he was like a sort of. It was strange because he he kind of had his own universe, and it remained as as as, as a constant throughout all his stories. But his stories swung, you know, off in all sorts of tangents, but mm. they were always within this this particular universe. This kind of this this setting, this this idea of. Of, of power resting with a with a sort of with a kind of unattributable force in in in, in, in the, on Earth, which kind of ruled, which kind of ruled mankind, mm. but ruled it in in a way kind of benignly most of the time. But if it had to act, it would act in, with such terrifying ruthlessness. Mm. That, you know, I mean, but, but I just like that. And of course, he yeah uh, he had his under people. Is that a way to a, a certain extent get around um, uh, the, the, the 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 difficulties of of a story becoming so popular that if you just continue a story on and on and on, it can get stale, it can get boring. But if you just have lots of stories within the same universe, then it yeah. remains fresh. Yeah, that, that, yes, well, they would do because you know you can you have different characters appear, and also so occasionally you have. Same character mm. coming, but they, they 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 appear in such odd, such wildly different settings within the confines of his 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 um, of his universe. I mean, there's a there's, I think one of his best stories I've always seen, one of his most scary ones. It's called The Crime and the Glory of Commander Susdal. Um, without going into any detail and stuff, basically, Susdal made a mistake. Mm. It was a terrible mistake. It caused the it caused I mean he should have he should have sacrificed himself that was his mistake he didn't and by doing so he put earth and mankind in danger and caused the instrumentality to have to seal off part of the galaxy like mm. forever um, literally quarantine it you know and um, <clears throat> and of course he had to be punished for this and uh, and um, we don't we don't we never we never knew in that story what the punishment was but then in a later story i think some years later it was it was written um almost as an aside mm. he's on this awful place called the, it's, he appears on this awful place called the prison planet shale where um where people 
some enzymes sort of they keep you alive mm. and they keep you growing they keep you know, and it's used as it's, 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 it's used basically to harvest limbs mm. right okay because they'll always grow new limbs you yeah, see yeah. But, but also they start losing their original shape and and I think we have this sort of mention just just a sort of side mention of Susdal is this what somebody thought was a hillock mm. is actually Susdal now he's been reduced to this strange you know <laughs> enzyme ridden flesh right. and that was his punishment you see mm. the thing is that it lasts forever because you can't die on, on a shale you just become part of it but very very slowly over a long time and as you do so people come along and slice off the new limb because mm. it's um, perfectly perfectly good for transplanting uh, and I quite like that idea <laughs> And there was, that was his punishment. You, see, mm. you didn't actually know what that punishment was when you read the original story. It's only that you come across it later. And yeah. Then you realise, God, <laughs> this is really <laughs> awful, you know. What a fate. And, uh, I mean, it, 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 it's uh, interesting that, that, you know, you're clearly brimming with enthusiasm for, 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 for the ideas of these uh, stories. You get something like Future Shocks, where it's idea, 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 even if it's one page, two page, three pages, um, tied into, I guess, what you were talking about earlier, which is, you know, you can fire a bunch of these off in a couple of weeks, in a month, and that allows you to go yeah, off and do your thing. But, I mean, I sort of, um, I mean, some of my Future Shocks were definitely, um, well, there's one particular one that's very much based on a Cordwain or Smith. Right um, story, and um, a story was called Mother Hitton's Mother Hitton's Little Kittens, with a nice sort of sweet name for one of the most terrifying stories I think I've ever read. <laughs> you should try it one day and see. Okay, uh, it is scary. Mm. I mean, seriously scary. You know, it's not like a sort of uh, it's kind of scary that makes you think. Right that. Oh, it makes you kind of hope that this never does happen and um, and I did a future shock which is actually not just a one or two part I think it was seven pages right. the, um, the Edge of Forever mm. and that was very much based on the ideas elicited in Goldwyn Smith's original story um, and in, actually it was quite a powerful one but it didn't have it didn't have the sheer horror. Mm. I mean, that probably wouldn't have been allowed <laughs> of, uh, of, of his of his story. And uh, we do, now doing stuff for for, for two thousand AD. Um, did you see much difference in 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 the craft, the the, the way that you had to write for, aside from the subject matter for two thousand AD, from having done battle and commando and things like that? No, you got a couple more pages. That was that was good because you know got more money. Um, I mean, the technicalities of it were exactly the same, right. and still are. I mean, nothing's you know that hasn't changed. Mm. It's like you know. Um, I mean, there are there are kind of different tropes occasionally that you see like the side. Well, the stuff like Garth Ennis did, where you have the kind of the the almost innumerable pictures of a, the variations just of a of a single scene, mm. which um, which is okay, I suppose, if you've got a whole book to put it in. But it doesn't really work on a, on a sort of comic which comes out every week or two weeks. Sure. You know, you've got to sort of you know you've got to keep it moving. Mm. Uh, so on that on that basis, it was. It was uh, yes, it wasn't very different at all. Mm. It just, you know, it just kept things moving. And I guess because there'd been such a, um, a crossover of editorial as well, from because uh, you know you get Steve McManus moving over to to, to two thousand AD, um, you'd got all the contacts there. You, you worked with them before. It was just a case of pitching as you'd always yeah, done well, before. You know, it was sort of just. Um, Go along to the next office. Yeah, that sure. was it, really. You know, <laughs> um, 
might have been on a different floor, but they were still in the same building. So it was, uh, um, no, it was, you know, yes, it was a very incestuous setup. But it still is. Uh, well, let's um, let's talk about Star Lord, which was 2000 AD's sister publication, um, for which you did Mind Wars. Yeah. Um, what was your inspiration that? Because that sounds very much still in the the the, the vein of the the the, the Cobainer Smith kind of epic, yeah. slightly fantastically yeah. edged stuff. In a way, I suppose it was like he had um, the. Um, I tried to make the Federation as a not a benign organization. Mm. You know, there's, there's often these case in these things where you know. I'm, I'm, I'm a cynic. I don't believe that people are either good or bad. I think they're all a bit in the middle. Even, even my, even even my aliens weren't. Were, were sort of, you know, they 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 did their best. They were doing it for their own reasons. And it wasn't sort of, um, in a way, the the worst character wasn't Narutha, the Cosmol. It was Doctor Van, the Federation controller, mm. who had no hesitation in sort of ordering. Deaths of deaths of the twins and deaths of planets, destruction of planets, you know, yeah. um, and that was a bit of a kind of the instrumentality of Gordwain and Smith, sort of uh, that kind of mentality of where you just. But I suppose it's just sort of it's 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 almost distilled pragmatism. Mm. You let nothing else, you let nothing stand in the way of. Of what you want to do, and it doesn't really matter who mm. suffers or what, what happens. Think because that 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 kind of that evokes what kind of thoughts of um, your kind of Asimov's foundations, and even things like uh, uh, um, Hubbard's oh, on Hubbard's kind of you know target <laughs> Earth and things like that. <laughs> Not that you know uh, that was the the, yeah, the pulp yeah, I was yeah. absorbing when I was eighteen years old, um, but. No, I can't say I'm ever very keen on Asimov. I didn't like the, right. his ideas and, mm. of a foundation or anything else. I, I, it was too sort of, I don't know. It, it was, was almost too conventional. It was like <laughs> it was like it was like Earth transplanted into space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And nothing and among the stars, but nothing else had changed. Mm. And, and and I do believe things would. You know, you won't. You, you, you wouldn't have a a stellar a stellar race or a stellar civilization. Would be nothing like we could imagine. Mm, mm. Um, but maybe people wouldn't be so different. You know, so so the sort of the nasties will still be there, mm. and the people trying to do good. And the people who just get caught up through no fault of their own, which mm. is which is which was Ardini Lacan's sort of fate in that. With, uh, with something like Mind Wars, it actually reads as being quite um, um, uncompromising still, um, because you, I mean, you've, spoilers for anybody uh, who hasn't read it, but you've, you've you've got these almost kind of mythical twins with with, with these powers, and then. Eventually, one of them is forced to kill the other one, um, and and you, you uh, importantly, it's the girl who's forced to kill the boy as well, well because I'm a great believer in, I suppose, equality like that. I don't, I never, I could never understand why the heroes had to be men. Mm. You know, I mean, if. Uh, you know, if 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 a woman has a gun, then she can be the hero as well, if you want. But often they also have the intelligence. Because when when you did um, Death Planet for two thousand AD, um, uh, what was her name Lorna Vaughan? Lorna Vaughan, yeah, I keep, yeah. I keep recycling names. So she <laughs> she could be she could well be the sort of great 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 grandmother of <laughs> the Federation guy. Um, <laughs> I mean, she was 2080's first lead character. Yeah, I was a bit, I was a bit disappointed by the artwork on that one. Oh, really? I, she looked a bit sort of, uh, she looked a bit too sort of 
girly, mm. I suppose. Not what I had in mind. I mean, Ardini was much better. Mm. Ardini was much more definitely what I had in mind. Because uh, Mind Wars was what Jesus Hes- was on there, was it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, you've, you've, you've got this kind of history of working with some absolutely fantastic... I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about uh, Massimo Ballardinelli when we talk about uh, Meltdown Man, but you, you've you've had some fantastic artists, Carl Sesquera, Jesus Dondo, Massimo. Um, well, I like, I've also... I also, at least I know two of them that, mm. um, that Jesus... Favorite story was Mind Wars. Oh, really? And Bernardinelli's favorite story was Meltdown Man. Right. Because in both cases, they got they were essentially free to do what they want, what, what they did best. I think. Well, let's let's talk about uh, Meltdown Man because it, it it it's a. Uh, I've always found it uh, fascinating because at, at the time, two thousand AD was. Um, it was fairly settled. It was approaching its kind of early adolescence. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, not much further down the line, you, 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 you get the, uh, the, the shift in um, uh, the, the kind of style of it. So it becomes more mature. Uh, there's there's, there's a, a lot more kind of meta storytelling with things like Zenith and um, then you get slain the horn god etc etc et bad company with things like meltdown man it, it it felt very much um a kind of harking back to this kind of slightly fantastical sf that we've already talked about where um you have a straightforward sci-fi premise man gets vaporized by a nuclear explosion finds himself in this in, in, in incredible environment um kind of a Planet of the Apes reversal kind of kind of mm. thing, um, but it, it, yeah, it felt very much like um, coming from the earlier days of of of, of, two, of 2000 AD. So it was it was a, a lot more fantastical. It was fantastical SF. Um, I mean, that had, had it always been your intention with that strip to to you know do something that was over the top and wild and fantastical. Well, at the same time, write a story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this this has always been the most important thing. Mm. Uh, if you don't have a story, what have you got? Um, I'd have nice artwork, <laughs> lots of people prancing about. Um, but actually, you know, at the end of the day, you need a story to push it along. Mm. Um, when you've got a good, solid story going with good characters and enough room to be able to move them around. Um, I mean, basically, you know, I mean, I, I was able to split up, to split it into three separate stories mm. all running concurrently or running in parallel. But I didn't have to feature each one each week. Mm. I could concentrate on one, one, one character one week and another character another week. Um, and... Um, and it left room for, you know, it left room for kind of almost sort of domestic scenes and stuff. Like in Mind Wars, too. I mean, you, know, you can even laugh at it. Like, what's wrong with it? I mean, like, what do you think everybody in the world is, all these people are going to, constantly out marching around, killing people or mm. in fights or, 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 or being, having their minds blown by some complete horror. I mean, it's, it's, that's, that's not storytelling. That's like sort of just, scenes mm. but I mean somehow you've got to rope them together into, a, into an idea of a story they have to have they have, to have I think a coherence and you can do that it's it's surprising how you can have a quiet period in a story in it and it kind of reinforces it it makes mm. it gives it certainly gives you a better idea of the characters um I wish I had more time to have really complicated characters, or complex characters anyway. Mm. Um, they're what interests me. It wasn't so much the creatures or the animals or the stuff, it was the, it was the 
central characters that were important and how they reacted and what they did and how they changed, you see. I mean, mm. I even had time to actually change them. They weren't sort of, you know, well, you know, people who set off on one side. I mean, I had most of them. You know, the Tiger Commander was the most unlikely sort of switcheroo, but you know, but we were able to build up the story to the point where he was actually that's all he could do. Mm. He had to sort of change sides. Um and whereas the, the tracker, Billy the Pup, who was he, his was a sort of longer conversion, a, a slower, more steady one. Mm. A bit like him, you see, and then when he then finally, it kind of dawns on him that he's working for the wrong side. I mean, it must be quite a balancing act. I mean, I've, I've spoken with other writers about this before, about only having a five or six page chunk every week, but telling a story over a very long period of time. Because Meltdown Man was, what, 50 episodes, which is a, 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 a you know, puts it as one of the longest um, series that 2008 has ever run. Um, must be quite a balancing act to, to to have those character moments, to have that character development while keeping your eye on, you know, it's each episode has got to have a beginning, a middle, and a cliffhanger. No, 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 I've okay. never, never, there's never been a problem. All oh, right, okay, no, so just, 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 I just, you know, I let, I let the cliffhangers come naturally. Mm. That's how you do it. I mean, yeah. How I do it anyway. Um, I can't start one and think this is going to be the start an episode and think this is going to how it's going to end because it might not work out that way. I didn't. I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't do synopses for or for for episodes. Mm. Um, apart from anything else, by the time you've written it, you may as well write written the episode anyway. Um, so often don't know how that particular episode is going to end. I mean, I always know what the story arc is, and I know where I'm going with it. Yeah. But the actual particular incident that might end it is something that sometimes just comes out of nowhere, really. Um, I always know how many more how many more frames I've got left. And as I go, I sort of aim towards an ending that's going to carry on next week. Mm. Uh or in Meltdown Man's case, might not carry on next week. We might have a gap for a few weeks before we come back to that. But it doesn't matter. You, know, you just still have the, that, that particular cliffhanger. Mm. Um, but I, I don't map them out. I don't say, you know, just, I don't start off by saying this is going to this is going to end like this because that's because it might not work out that way. And if, mm. if trying to just do it for the sake of doing it can destroy the and destroy the sort of rhythm of the story. Coming, you, you mentioned there that there, there, there would be gaps um, where you know, yeah. there, there wouldn't be uh, that particular story. I mean, what, what, why was well, that? You go, well, I mean, you know, we, we're following, we're following three. Wait, we were following three and eventually four characters. Mm. Um, on different quests, yeah. they're part of the same quest. Obviously, is what their their aim is, but they they each have their own trail to follow, mm. their own route. And it was nice not to have to try and squash each one, a bit of each into each episode. Yeah. It was much, it made much more sense and read much better to just have a whole episode devoted to. Gruff doing what he was doing, and then T Bone doing what he was doing. So that's what I mean by then. You might, you know, so you might have finished with Deanna and Stone, and it might be three, three weeks or something before you go back to them. Mm. You know. I mean, but it's the, not like it's not like a gap. There's only a no, gap no. for those characters. Yeah, yeah, the story yeah, carries yeah. on, you see. Yeah. And after all, you want to know what the other ones are doing. Because I mean that 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 is an art to 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 be able to just put that plot aside for a moment, concentrate on somebody else, and then come back to it, and and for the readers to follow you through that. I mean that's 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 skillful. I, I, I imagine many writers would struggle with with something uh, of multiple storylines going on at the same time. Oh, you know, it's, I I wouldn't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I I don't struggle with it. I mean, I, I never have. It wasn't yeah. sort of any. Uh, it just to me it was just a logical way of doing it. Mm. You know, this is how you do it, and it's like, 
in a way, I suppose it's like writing a book. It's that kind of line of, yeah. of of thought where you can shift from you look at one character for a while and you shift to another character because it wouldn't make sense to just keep into juxtapo- interposing them one after the other mm. in very quick, quick little bits. You know, I mean, Meltdown Man would have been a disaster if I'd had sort of each one would be two pages of Stone and Leanna, two pages of T-Bone, two pages of Gruff. You yeah. know, would have been totally disjointed. And it, as long as you've got, as long as you've got the reader hooked, then off you go. Yeah. You know? I mean, you, 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 you're talking about multiple characters. Uh, Whereas with something like Rat Pack, where you still had multiple characters, but but again, you had to squeeze everybody in. Everybody had to have yeah. their little moment in the light. Yes, that's what I didn't like very much. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, if you're going to do that, then you, you just needed fewer characters. Mm. Yeah. I mean, let's let's talk about Massimo. Um, is is because in many ways, Meltdown Man is is, is his great opus of of absolutely incredible artwork um you, you you provided reference for him for some of the characters didn't you well for the animals mm. um yeah so we went and got up went to foils and bought this gigantic color encyclopedia of world animals uh on ipc's tab <laughs> <laughs> and i just just to, and i took it home with me and i cut it just look through it and mm. see what see I just didn't want to keep doing the same same old same old you know yeah. I thought, let's have some really exotic sort of creatures here and it's great pictures and I, so I uh, found one that I liked suited yeah. cut it out take it in and send it off with the script to, right. to Massimo so did, did, did were you having conversation with Massimo or yeah. was it just conducted through editorial yeah right I mean, I got the sort of message back that he he loved doing this, and mm. I, I thought, and basically, I just for me it made it much easier because I mean, you know, I didn't have to I could concentrate on the story and not have to keep doing the picture descriptions. I think this is why I, why I have been successful with the white artists quite fond of me sometimes. Mm. They, I don't try and tell them what to do. Yeah. Once it's been set up, <coughs> let them go. I mean, I only I saw the first I saw the first artwork for for Mind Wars, mm. and kind of pretty much ditched my picture descriptions, except for the kind of the action, and what, yeah. know, what the sort of thing is. But for for the characters, they they were done. They were obviously that's fine, great. He, he's happy with the characters. I'm happy with the characters. Yeah, and um, and, and let him go with it. And I think that was the same with Massimo as well. You know, once once I realised he was going to be there, he, he really liked sort of doing these sort of things. Just send the picture, and, mm. you know. That's you know, and yeah, tell him what what they're actually up to. You know, fleeing through a forest and blah blah blah. But, yeah. You know, but I always kept it down to a minimum after that. Well, did did you ever um, uh, get a feeling of kind of I don't know being egged on to do ever more? Fantastical things with with something like Meltdown Man because you thought you know Massimo, Massimo will make a a really great image out of this. Well, I suppose it got to a super UG's mm. idea, which was sort of. Uh, but even that, I suppose. I mean, I I I'd, I'd already had it in mind. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't go blindly into these things. Sort of. I mean, I remember some some blog I read a few years ago. Somebody sort of. Very sort of you know authoritarian, authoritarianly saying, saying how he thought I must, how 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 remarkable he must be that he 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 kept just writing these things out week after week mm. without knowing what, where it was going. I mean, I thought, you know, who the fuck is this? I mean, sorry, <laughs> right. I mean, it's like obviously somebody's never written a multi-part story for, yeah. for a comic but you know I mean I, I mean the idea that if you embark on something like this without not knowing where it was going to go or how it was going to end it's just insane um, how, how, how much planning would you generally do was it, was it a, a, a just you'd kind of fix your mind on it or would you write it out or I, might, 
I might well have given a typed sheet or something mm. as, a, as a sort of reference to the editor, but that's it really, you know. Yeah. This is it, this is how it's gonna be, this is how the story is, you know. It's like think of Lord of the Rings with people on their epic gang of four on their epic quest. Yeah. Um you have this idea of this of these of the Yugis they call them, which is called when you misunder people, mm. animal people basically, that's what it was about, who have no rights. Um and um and that's what you've got really. It's yeah. like a sort of story of a revolution. Uh because there, there, there are themes that kind of seem to play out through your, your work. Think, think things like uh, uh, revolution, slavery. Um, you, you've, you've got aspects of um, uh, racism in something like El, El Mestizo. You've got sexism when when you come to um, things like uh, um, Death Planet, uh, and uh, you know, as, as you said, something like Mind Warts. Are those themes important to you? Is it, is it that the story must always have a, a, a background theme, or is this just something that comes out as the story, as the story develops? Well, I suppose it's just how I see the world. <laughs> sort of, you know, I mean, I, um, I sort of, um, I can't understand. I suppose I can't really understand sexism. Mm. I sort of, I don't. I don't actively or th think about it or anything. It just doesn't occur to me why, you know, I'm just always amazed that it should happen. Mm. I sort of, and so when I write, I make sure it doesn't. That's quite important. Mm. I think it's important anyway. Uh, and I mean, I think, you know, I mean, I mean, Ardini was a, was actually yes, I think she was unusual. She was a female, the female lead, mm. um, and she was the lead. You know, there was no doubt about it. Nobody was as powerful as her. Nobody yeah. drove the story like her. Nobody did things that she had to do. And uh, and yet, throughout it, she's still you know, still looking for boyfriends and stuff. And when I mean, she's only seventeen, mm. so you know she's. But she's had her parents sort of killed in front of her eyes for the sole reason of inducing a trauma to make her receptive to this alien radiation. Mm. Um, she's smart enough and intelligent enough to override it where her brother isn't. And because the alternative is that death is the end of Earth, she mm. has to kill him. Mm very pragmatic thing to do <laughs> one of the things I was going to ask about was the, the amazing Maze du Bois yeah, which was uh, a, a, a two part story he did with Ian Gibson now I read an interview with Ian where he um, he said that was the kind of tryout for uh, Halo Jones I think that was written with hindsight with hindsight right okay okay <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can do all sorts of things in hindsight. <laughs> but do you, do you remember if that was a, a, a story that, that Ian suggested to you, or that you came up and he just drew, or it would have been mine? Right. Okay. I didn't discuss things with artists. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, it's a crazy idea. You know, artists do the drawings. Me, I'm I'm the one that comes up with the story. Sure, sure. Um, I mean, you didn't see the artist anyway most of the time. Mm. You know. It's not like we had meetings or sort of, you know, discuss things. I mean, what's, what's to discuss? Look, here's a story. Go do the artwork. Um, you know, I mean, that's how it works, really. Yeah. And, and that's how you get the best stories, I think. I mean, I, think, I, don't, I don't think... I mean, I don't think there are very many genuine writer-artists around. Mm. In fact, I would say there probably aren't any, because they've got to, be good at, got to be good at one or the other. And... Um, I don't pretend to be an artist. I've never pretended to be an artist. And I'd I mean, be very unhappy about artists who pretend to be writers. Yeah. It, I mean, it's it's, it's, it's interesting that, that um, people sort of talk about the, the Marvel method, you know, the way that, that uh, Stanley used to do stuff where it's like, here's a rough outline, you draw the pictures, and I'll come in and I'll, 
I'll insert the dialogue and muck it around. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't read Marvel. <laughs> I've never read Marvel, but I suppose I, I read it enough to know that I never want to read it. Right, right. I don't, you know. We, I mean, we haven't got time to sort of touch on on, on everything you've done, but I mean, you, you did stuff for for, for Eagle and and uh, lots of other publications as well. But um, looking back on your time writing comic books, um, and you've continued doing comic books um, uh, even though you've not been in two thousand AD. Um, what's your feeling about? Uh, the stories that you did do you look back on them with with pride with a critical eye um was it just a job you know what what's, what's your feeling about um having had a a, a, a a long career in comics well mind wars was my particular favorite All right that's when i'm quite proud of i had mm. no problems with that meltdown man was good too and sort of it was nice to do it of the other ones, you know, easy was easy. I suppose I, I mean, I mean that as a pun. Um, didn't really take much thought or mm. sort of effort. The general dies at dawn was much more satisfying. All oh, right, okay, because that was a quite a challenging sort of idea. Mm. Um, and having the countdown, the whole sort of, the whole sort of. Um, also having a sort of German hero, if you want, who wasn't, who was obviously, you know, not had his own sort of issues. Mm. Um, so that was quite a satisfying one. Mm. Fighting Man too was quite good. That was another, another one I remember fondly. Most of the rest, I not sort of really care too much. Would have been nice to have got Maze de Moire off the ground. Right. Um, and I'm still trying to work out whatever happened to the whatever happened to um, Death Squad. Uh, tell, tell us, tell us a bit about Death Squad. Well, you know that was this sort of that was definitely off that. I can't remember his name now. The, the Danish guy who wrote those was in the seventies wrote a load of things about the com about the, about the um, German German sort of convict platoon. All oh, right, okay. Punishment platoon. Yeah. Um, can't remember his name. I mean, all the characters were based really on his characters, um, and in many ways, it was actually quite a quite a nasty sort of uh, quite. A, yeah, it was probably one of the grittiest ones actually. That, um, as far as I know, it sort of ended. It ended at. It ended with a sort of thing saying, you know, and. What happens next week? Yeah. And it disappeared. I can't <laughs> remember what happened there. I mean, I can't remember why that happened. Um, well, it ran for a year or something. It was quite, you know, it was okay. And there was that crazy Keller thing, which is really just an American easy. But both of those were Eric Bradbury, mm. who did great artwork and sort of just love his characters. He did better. I think he did some of the best faces mm. of all, you know. and he did fantastic hardware as well. He did he was very good at doing war war stories. He made he added he injected a kind of realism to them. Um, what like I said, you, you you've still been doing uh, Commando, but what's your uh, career been like um, since? kind of period we've been talking about the 70s, 80s? Um, not much. Done some writing. Mm -hmm. Bit of property, property transactions. Right. I've actually <laughs> paid far more than the writing ever did. Right. Um, written some books, which I must try and get published one of these days. Right. Uh, that's that. That's really bad, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, I never stopped writing. Mm. Uh, I mean, I've already got, I've already got three volumes finished of a multi-part historical, well, historical, twentieth-century set stories, and set in the sixties with, with 
but it, it's, it's, it's something I really enjoy doing because it's got like sort of it's got about sort of thirty main characters, <laughs> all of whom have their own secrets, and it's. No. Well, I mean, I say thirty main characters. It actually only has four main characters. Mm. They're all female because I do like strong female characters. Um, and but it's the way that, as a result of what happens between them, their entire lives are turned upside down, in that they begin to realise that nothing they know about themselves is. Is actually the truth mm. that their histories, their family histories, are much, much, much wilder than they ever imagined, and it's led to some quite interesting sort of complications and, mm. and lots of sort of violence and sex and everything else. <laughs> I mentioned Maze Dubois. It, it wasn't until I was doing the research for this interview that I actually came across the characters it wasn't a character that I'd, I'd seen in, a, in my previous read-throughs of 2008 explain a bit about Maze Dubois for those of uh, those of the listeners who, who, who haven't read it it was only a two-parter wasn't it yeah well yeah. I suppose he's just intended to the sort of female interstellar James Bond really right um, but with um, certainly with added sex <laughs> I mean, even those, even those drawings have been touched up. Mm. Um, didn't last long enough. Didn't get, in, obviously, didn't get my head around it enough to right. uh, sort of, you know. Basically, she'd have had, she'd have had this other guy as a foil. Mm. Um, he'd have been hauled. He'd have been hauled into all sorts of strange situations with a wild situation certainly mm -hmm. but that's it you know and so they say I mean it was, it was only sort of two episodes and that's it yeah I mean, I it, 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 say about that it, well, it, but it, it, it's it's interesting that, 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 that in hindsight Ian has kind of maybe moulded it into um, you know a, a, at least thought about it as, as precursoring his, his, his work on uh, something like Halo Jones and and it, it's fascinating that you know you, you you've said you know you enjoy writing female characters, um, and actually 2080 has a fairly you know as, as comics go um, has a fairly decent hist history with them. But it's it's a kind of I guess something like Maze Dubois is an interesting footnote of, a, of, a, of an, an early like you say it's kind of female James Bond style character yeah. uh, thing because it. it, it there are um, there are stories certainly that, that, that you did that, that uh, you know more recent writers have, have named as being inspiration because something like Death Planet um, Al Ewing uh, talked about it being um, kind of uh, partial inspiration for Zombo which is his, his comedy zombie uh, series um, so yeah I've, 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 I find it, it interesting to see like even just a short series how it can inspire future writers i suppose i mean i don't know i mean i didn't sort of I've, i have to say i've never i've never actually taken inspiration from other comic writers right at all. interesting you know, i mean mm. so, but i have taken them from sci-fi writers mm. Mm. So no problems with that um, well, it's the old um, Gene Roddenberry principle, isn't it? Because so many of those early Star Trek episodes were. Um, well, they were certainly based on yeah. yes, raid, raiding the raiding the galaxy in astounding tales archives. Mm -hmm. yeah. I hope you enjoyed that Earthlets, and thank you to Alan for coming all the way into Oxford to uh, to chat to us. Do let us know what you think about the interviews that we're doing and any names that you would like featured in the future. Just email us at thrillcast, or one word, at 2080online.com. Join us in two weeks' time for more interviews, more talking about 2000 AD, and more just unadulterated thrill power. Until next time, athletes, splendid birthrig. <laughs>
Cell power levels dangerously high. Alert! Alert! Read 2000 AD every week. Ask your comic book store or newsagent now. Subscribe to the galaxy's greatest comic at 2000adonline.com. Subscribe digitally on our apps for Apple, Android, and Windows 10. And download the RM free copies from 2000adonline.com. Alert! Alert! Stand by for urgent updates. Search for 2000AD on Twitter and Facebook. Watch the latest videos at youtube.com forward slash 2000AD online. And follow on Instagram at insta 2000AD. Program complete. Shutting down.